I've really, really, really been looking forward to this, uh, and I would like now to introduce our very special guest. Dr. Champa came to Samford in August 2018 from the NIDA Institute for Biblical Scholarship of American Bible Society, where he provided advanced professional development in biblical studies, Bible translation, and scripture engagement for leaders in that area of scholarship around the world. Previously, he was professor of New Testament and chair of the Division of Biblical Studies at gordon Conwell Theological Seminary near Boston, where he taught for 13 years and where he continues to provide leadership for their Doctor of Ministry track in Bible translation. Before going to gordon Conwell, he was a missionary professor of Biblical Studies in Portugal for over a decade and served as a translator for the Portuguese Bible Society's contemporary Portuguese translation of the Bible. Dr. Champa teaches New Testament Biblical Studies here at Sanford, and his research focuses on the use of Old Testament within the, the New Testament and Pauline studies. He is, um, I don't, well, it doesn't say here, but I um, want to make clear he is the chair of the religion department of Sanford University. He's an ordained Baptist minister who has served in various roles in churches in Portugal, Scotland, and the U.S. He's married with two adult children and one grandson. Two now. Oh, okay. It needs to be updated uh -huh. a little bit. All right. Well, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. All right. Thank you. <clears throat> he enjoys hiking, boating, traveling, studying, and teaching the Bible. Um, we have been privileged this year for him to be the co-chair of the um, committee that has given us our new dean. And I actually had the privilege of getting to know him a little better, being on the committee for the, uh, what is called a Spiritual Life Collaborative Committee that is exploring how we can increase the spiritual life on campus and increase the Christian mission of Sanford University. He's a man of um, good humor. I've enjoyed being around him. And he's also someone who loves the Lord. Please welcome Dr. Roy Champa. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, not sure I recognize that person, but um, very happy to be here uh, and to talk about this subject uh, about which I am very passionate and very many people are passionate, um, which is one of the reasons why uh, Bible translators uh, are sometimes burned at the stake because there are lots of passions about Bible translation what you should or should not be doing when you're translating the Bible. Uh, being burned at the stake is just one of the challenges, not so much a contemporary challenge as a historical challenge, uh, but we want to talk about this unfinished and never-ending task, some of the contemporary challenges and opportunities. This is going to be like drinking water from a fire hose. I'm going to run you through a whole number of challenges and opportunities and issues in Bible translation. And I'm going to go through it as quickly as I can. I encourage you to take notes about things that you'd like to talk about, because the reason I'm going to go quickly is in the hope of having time at the end for a Q&A and just talk about the things that you're most interested in talking about of all the myriad of issues that I'm going to raise, okay? But we've saved a little bit of time because you already got all my background, so there's nothing more I need to do with that. Uh, so we can move right into uh, a little bit of context for the world of Bible translation. Uh, these images are from the website of the Forum of Bible Agencies International, known as FOBI, which is an organization that tries to bring uh, to keep open communication between, excuse me, all of these agencies working in the area of Bible translation work around the world. Now, this is not all of the agencies. This is just the first set of agencies I could fit on a screen. Of course, I was working with American Bible Society, which had me collaborating uh, with folks from United Bible Societies and from Seed Company and Wycliffe Bible Translators. These are just some of uh, the people. This list of members comes from the FOBI website, um, which is worth visiting. If you're interested in finding out how you might be involved in Bible translation, we can talk about that. But these are many of the agencies that are promoting the work of Bible translation in various ways. Each one has its own focus, its own emphasis, its own special contribution. Um, probably, the, probably the most well-known ones are, are Wycliffe Bible Translators, but that's actually a family of organizations. 
and the two largest players are the various agencies related to Wycliffe Bible Translators. Um, these agencies are kind of united through the Wycliffe Global Alliance, and these agencies include SIL International, Seed Company. Uh, Wycliffe Associates is, is a, a new player with uh, Wycliffe background and the Wycliffe name. Many people have been working as, known as Wycliffe Bible Translators in the States and raising their funding through them have been known overseas. Or traditionally, they were working overseas as members of SIL International. Now they're working as members of SIL International or Seed Company or one of these other agencies. And then the other uh, big player are the United Bible Societies. And so these are national Bible societies all over the globe. I was working with the American Bible Society, but there are hundreds of different countries that have their own national Bible society, which are dedicated to promoting the translation, um, printing, and distribution of God's word. One of the distinctives of the United Bible Societies and the National Bible Societies is that they are the main ones that have a focus on providing people with whole Bibles, whereas many Bible translation agencies are doing what they can to provide uh, sample texts, maybe to get uh, a language, a New Testament, or reading certain select texts from the Old Testament or Old and New Testament. Um, it's often the United Bible Societies in collaboration with these other agencies that are, are focused on the, uh, the whole Bible aspect of the work. There are also smaller Bible translation agencies and institutes established in various regions uh, around the world. I thought I listed one here, but maybe I'll bring them up later. So in Kenya, they have a, a language and translation agency established in Kenya and focused on Bible translation work in that part of the world. Uh, there's a word for the world which is established and, and working out of South Africa. So many of these are, are started off as North American-based agencies. More and more, they're, they're global agencies, and then there are regional agencies as well. It's a complicated world. Actually, even to try and explain in detail or accuracy the relationship between all the Wycliffe uh, agencies, it confuses people that are working for some of the Wycliffe agencies, whether you're with Seed Company or you're with... Uh, are you, I thought you were Wycliffe Bible Translators, but now you're SIL International or you're Seed Company or you're, is Wycliffe Associates the same thing as Wycliffe Bible Translators? And that would be a whole conversation on its own. Some of the challenges. And usually when people think about challenges of Bible translation, when people come to our Doctor of Ministry track in Bible translation, many times they think, I'm going to learn more Greek and Hebrew. Um, because Bible translation is all about linguistics, and I just need to know the language that I'm translating into, and I need to, need to know the biblical languages, and once I know those two things, I'm ready to go. But actually, um, translation is much more complicated than a linguistic uh, process, and challenges are challenges about things that have to do sometimes with ideology and philosophy of translation, questions like, where are translation decisions being made? And by whom? Are people in Dallas, Texas, or someplace else in the United States, or London, England, making the decisions about how the Bible will be translated in Kenya, or Japan, or some other part of the world? Or do people in those parts of the world get to make those decisions? Um, so where are they being made? Are they being made locally? Are they being made at a distance? These are questions that are still being worked out by various agencies. Who can translate? And who gets to be called a translator? How much training do you have to, be, have, to have before you can be a translator? Do you have to know Greek and Hebrew? Do you have to have a college education, a seminary education? In the past, they used to refer to the American expatriate that would go overseas as and work on a Bible translation, and they were called the Bible translator. And all the local people around them were called translation or language helpers. Now most agencies working the Bible translation realize that that wasn't quite fair and was an injustice. 
and would refer to the fact that actually what's going on is that the local people are the translators, sometimes referred to as mother tongue translators. They're the ones that have all the linguistic resources in their language. They're the ones that can say whether or not this way or that way of translating something would make sense and what that would mean. And so now the tendency is to say, no, the expatriate going over might be an exegetical advisor or a translation advisor. But the translators are the, are the local people who speak that language as their mother tongue and speak it fluently. But that's not treated the same way everywhere. So these are questions that have been worked, are still being worked on in the 21st century and certainly at the end of the 20th century. Challenges like how to recruit translators without removing them from their economic context so they can continue working and living after the project is complete. Many translators are working in, in the, from villages that are, depend on agriculture. They've worked on farms. Their families have worked on farms and various kinds of agriculture for generations. And if you take them out and say, we're going to pay you a full-time salary for five, eight, ten years while you work on this translation, that's wonderful. What happens to them after the Bible translation is done? And all of a sudden, they gave up their farm. They gave up their other work. They're now well-trained as a translator into their language, their community. But you've got that translation done, and they may not be considered um, someone who would be a candidate to be a translation consultant. So these are some of the ethical issues that translation agencies work with as they, they try to find as many translators and as much help as they can, um, but also try to work through how can we do this in an ethical way that doesn't actually work against the interests of the translator in their long-term um, ability to survive. More recently, people have been asking questions like this. Do communities need to be converted to being literary cultures so that they will value a printed book? And for many years, this is... This was the, the main priority. We were used to having our Bible is in the form of a book. We go to, to cultures where they don't even have their language written down. Nobody has any written books. It's all an oral culture. So the first thing we do is establish literacy programs to turn them from an oral culture into a literary culture. And now that once they're a literary culture, we can give them a book to read, which is, which is the Bible. Well, that sometimes worked and sometimes it didn't work that well. And so more and more agencies are working on how to communicate God's word um, in oral means uh, for oral cultures and second guessing whether or not our first mission is to change societies into literate, that is book literate societies. So that is the question, are oral translations appropriate for oral cultures? And by the way, I'm using, at various places, I will use this kind of binary language, literary or literate, illiterate book, um, an oral, and those aren't very helpful. But we only have less than an hour, uh, and so these are shortcuts we use to, to cut through uh, and save some time. Otherwise, we could spend, I mean, obviously, uh, we could spend a whole semester or a whole year, or we could have a whole master's degree program just on some of the things that we're talking about. And then the question is, is the goal the production of a book or engagement with its message? Because unfortunately, in way too many places, people succeeded in producing a book and they'd have a great celebration. Everyone come out and march and dance and celebrate. We now have God's word in our language. Hallelujah. And then it sits on a shelf someplace. And people are very proud to know that God's word also exists in their language. But they've never read it, and they never learned to read, and they may not be all that. Well, they may be motivated. That doesn't mean they actually are going to be able to read. Um, and even in, and of course, we have this problem in some countries. You may have heard of this country um, called America. Yeah. Um, yeah. And this country called America, there are all kinds of people that have books on their shelf and they are literate and they can read, but they're not engaging with the Word of God. And actually, it's a very recent thing that Bible translation agencies have moved from the view that their job is to translate Scripture, and then once it's translated, to print it up and distribute it, and then go on to the next project and realize 
now they see what we call scripture engagement as part of their mission, making sure the people that are receiving the scriptures are actually engaging with it. And that usually means not waiting until the whole project is done before giving people the scripture, but thinking about what do they want to do with the scripture now? What kinds of evangelistic work, missionary work, um, what kinds of of discipleship do they want to do? What should we translate first and then give them that so they can start engaging with it and then get, give them more so they'll be engaging with that? That might slow down the project a little bit, but it can also mean that they'll be engaging with the scripture all the way through if this is done well. So seeing scripture engagement as part of the mission is a, is a pretty recent development. Some of the challenges entail the fact that Translation teams have a need for so many different kinds of expertise, as you might imagine, biblical languages, cultural backgrounds, and I'm thinking about biblical cultural backgrounds here, theological sensitivity, sensitivity to cultural issues in their <coughs> receptor culture, an expert feel for nuances of the receptor language. You really, I mean, ideally you want to have gifted literary wordsmiths, people that have this feel, is, is this just the right word? Does this sound right? Does this create the right connotation? They need to be poets and wordsmiths and not mere mechanics of language. And that's, these are difficult combinations of things to put together. They also need to be aware of their own tendency to assume key bits of knowledge and information. You can translate the scripture in ways in which all this kind of assumed knowledge is uh, required to actually make sense of what you're reading. Um, and so to have that sensitivity to how this is going to read and what kind of sense this will make to people that don't know as much as what the translators know. They also need the skills of diplomats to navigate church politics. You could, you could produce the most perfect Bible translation ever produced in any language ever but if you did something to offend uh, the village chief or one of the key pastors or leaders in that area, it doesn't matter if it's perfect. Uh, it might never, ever be used. Um, so these are, these are skills that Bible translators need to know. By the way, in our Bible translation uh, track at Gordon-Conwell, we broke the track up, this is oversimplified, but into three main areas. The first residency focused on questions of uh, biblical interpretation and hermeneutics, which tended to be the things that most people thought that's what this whole thing should be about. But we had one year on biblical interpretation and hermeneutics. The second year was focused more on more questions of translation theory and Bible translation theory in practice, because you need to understand what translation is, how it works, um, how this has been discussed, what we're learning about translation in more recent years. And then the third year, we focus on um, kind of leadership skills, including conflict resolution, um, group leadership, other kinds of things that say if somebody, if a translation consultant doesn't know how to lead a group to have a successful project, it doesn't matter how brilliant they are and how much Greek and Hebrew they know, they'll never get that pro product done. Um, and again, if they don't know how to navigate church politics and other kinds of politics, then that could be a danger to the success of their project. In short, for a few of the points I've been making, translation is not a merely linguistic or mechanical activity and requires much more than knowledge of two different languages. Much, much more. Questions that translators wrestle with are how much biblical literacy should be assumed and how much literacy in general, we've already talked about the literacy question, but when you translate, can you, can you use, uh, say, the equivalent? In, in English, we say all the time, we are justified by faith. Uh, how many people here believe in justification by faith? I hope some people are taking notes. All those hands not raised will be a, uh, a problem. Is there a dean in the back that can keep track of this? Uh, I mean... I believe in justification by faith, but even as that expression rolls off my tongue, I'm using the word justification and justify in a word that isn't normal for the English language. If you're in the streets of Birmingham, Alabama, and says some, somebody says something about justification, 
they're talking about whether or not somebody should or should not have done something, right? And if they say something was, somebody was justified, then they had a good reason for what they're doing. It has nothing to do with what we mean by justification by faith. And some Bible scholars we, we, or translators refer to this as biblish. That is um, English words, or they could be you know, words in Japanese or some other language that have special meanings that we expect people to understand when they're reading the Bible that are different from the meanings of the words in everyday language. So how much of that knowledge? Should they know what we mean by justification, or should we translate it in such a way that it actually just means what it seems to mean? Like one way of translating justify would be to say they're declared righteous by God, for instance, in English would be one approach to that. By the way, I have opinions about almost everything I'm going to talk about, but I'm not going to share all of my opinions. They just may come through here or there. Translators make questions about whether they want to translate following what's called a formal or a functional equivalent or dynamic equivalent model of translation. Um, the formal equivalent tries to follow the, the word order um, and the structure of the original languages as much as possible. Dynamic equivalence pays more attention to the, the receptor language and how does what are the right forms and natural forms in this language. As someone who has worked in this area for a long time, it's, it stands out to me that most people today, if you get a lecture on Bible translation, it's all about the difference between formal and dynamic or formal and functional equivalents. Frankly, that was the way it was framed back in the 1960s and 70s, and translation theory has gone on long from there. But in the world of Bible translation, people are still stuck pretty much in this paradigm. So I mention it, but I also want to mention that um, that's not the only set of uh, philosophy questions to be asking. Another, uh, which sounds similar but is rather different, is the question of foreignization and domestication. That is, to what extent should a foreign work seem like something locally produced? When people read their Bible, in Angola, which is one of the places where I've spent years training Bible translators, should Angolans read the Bible and say, oh, this feels like it was written right here in Lubango or outside of Luanda? Or should it feel foreign? Now, with many of the questions I'll ask, you may think, well, that's a silly question. The, uh, the answer is obvious. So if you think that way, we can talk about that during the Q&A, because the answers don't tend to be quite so obvious. Um, no translation will foreignize completely. That is, will signal all the different ways this text actually reflects a foreign culture in a foreign time. No text will do that. No text will domesticate completely. That is, make it feel like it's part of the, the modern culture and world. But every translation does some of both to one extent or another. Should people be left to or led to think that their initial translation is a perfect representation of the original in all respects? This happens a lot, and one of the ways you know it happens a lot is every time somebody pr produces a second translation in any language, people are shocked. We already have God's word. Now you've produced a second translation? Are you saying that what we had wasn't God's word? It wasn't the perfect word of God? And then what happens next is they compare the new translation to the old translation. Well, this happened in the translation project I was involved in Portugal. They had the Portuguese version of the King James Version. And of course, when the contemporary version came out, people compared to the Portuguese, kind of the, the Almeida, which is like their King James. It's like, well, the, the, the Bible, meaning the Almeida, says this, but you said this. You need to fix this. <laughs> um, but part of that is because we so lift up translation, we're so afraid to let people know what translation really is and entails that they can't imagine that there could have been a way that the word could have been translated than the way that it was. And so you bring in another way, and it brings a crisis of faith. I think we need to be more honest about what translation entails um, and all the implications in ways that will support people's faith and not undermine it in the long run. Well, I, sometimes I just throw in random things. This is not random, uh, but this is going to be an issue that will come up in other contexts. 
1 John 3, 9, the contemporary English version translates this, those born from God don't practice sin because God's DNA remains in them. They can't sin because they are born from God. I had a little debate with one of the editors of the contemporary English version, and they just weren't taking it from me. They just, they said, this is just how we do Bible translation today. But I have a problem with this. Does anyone, can anyone imagine what my problem is? Was John and his readers were familiar with the idea of DNA? They had this advanced knowledge of what DNA is, and so we can read our Bible and find out, my goodness, we thought this was discovered in modern times, but this is in the Bible. <laughs> but that sort of thing happens not just in the contemporary English version, but in many other versions. We'll see there's the same problem as epileptic. Modern various versions will say that there was a young man suffering from epilepsy. Well, we'll look at that in a moment, but they didn't know it as epilepsy back in Jesus' day. So even the easy parts can be hard. How to translate theos? How should we translate that? God. Well, I mean, that's the word we usually translate as God, but you know, there are many places where Bible translation is done, and you know, the words they have for God, they're associated with their pre-Christian pagan background. And so people raise all kinds of concerns. We can't use that word for God because we're now talking about the true God. And this is the God. This word was used for our gods that we don't think is that God. And actually, I think a lot of Western prejudice can enter in right there. Does uh, anyone remember when God first said, Theos is the word for me? and not for any of the other false gods out there? Does anyone remember what the pagan Greeks called their pagan gods? They were in the singular theos, in the plural theoi. The word that we use for our god was used in pagan context long before it was used for Christian or Jewish meanings. But early Jews and Christians filled that word with new meaning to be understood in light of what the scripture said about the one true God. Now, this isn't me saying that every local deity or God or spirit in any, any place should be the right word for them to use for God, but to say it's a bit more complicated, and we do have to be sensitive to say, well, no, your word for God is tainted. Our word for God has this kind of pure as the driven snow background. I once I was at a translation conference and, a, and an African scholar was sharing a translation that was done in their language. I don't remember what the language was. Um, and I didn't understand 98% of everything in that Bible translation. But there was like 2% that I understood because in this African language, whenever they came to a theological term, God, the Father, Jesus Christ, Holy Spirit, they used English. So it'd be like, blah, 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 Holy Spirit, blah, blah, Jesus Christ, God the Father, blah, blah, blah. It's like, what on earth? Because English was thought to have this kind of purity of a Christian language, um, and all the terms in their language were thought to be um, contaminated. Um, that's what I was just talking about. How to translate, how do we, this is, so in our Bibles, you find Jesus, right? Lots of Jesus in your English translation, um, of course, that's the Greek word we translate, Jesus. Can, can someone read this to me from Greek? Jakobos, which would be like Jacob, right? That's James. So even getting people to agree on how should we translate biblical names into a local culture, we don't represent our biblical names the same way they're represented in in Greek, or in some cases in Hebrew. If they don't know what a sheep is, or a wineskin, or a chariot, or a charioteer, how do you deal with this? Do you provide them with a dictionary? Do you provide them with a picture book? Do you put in some substitution for something that would fill in a, a similar role in that context? And how about words like apostolos, baptisma, angelos, which we never translated in English? We just transliterate, apostolos. Well, we don't have a word like that. Let's just call it apostle. Um, baptisma, well, hmm, we're not sure what to do with that. Let's call it baptism. 
And how about angelos? I know we'll call it an angel. Translation can be challenging. You have to just look at all the different places where translations into English just said, let's punt. <laughs> <laughs> Or let's transliterate, and then we'll give people an understanding. We'll teach and let them learn what these words mean by our teaching and by their context. How about anthropos? It's translated man for generations and centuries. And then all of a sudden we started being sensitive in the English language. Man tended to be used in a gender-specific way. Um, and then so how do we translate now? Should it be mankind? Should it be a person? The King James Version says, don't do your good works before men. That's actually, you know, anthropoi or um, uh, anthropon, lest, you know, whatever. And then, so translations wrestle. Well, no one say, so do you say, do, don't do your good works before people? One translation says, don't do your good works before others. This is the word. It doesn't mean other, but they're just wrestling with how to get this idea across. Oh, maybe I'll say it. I love the ESV. I probably read from it or cite it in class more than any other. Uh, and I love Dr. Paul House, the first person I ever knew here, and other people involved with the ESV. But actually, it's the ESV that goes with others uh, before others, as I recall. And uh, I don't have a criticism of that. And it wasn't Dr. House, but some people on the ESV committee were extremely critical of the NIV or other people for making little substitutions like that. And the reality is every Bible translation has to make little things that say, well, the word doesn't mean other, but the, the, the literal word to say people or person would sound awkward. This is going to communicate most clearly. So I actually affirm the decision of the ESV. Um, and one of my points today is, if, in case you haven't gotten already, translation is complicated. And we probably need to be a bit more patient with translators if we don't understand all of the dynamics that are wrestling with as they make difficult decisions about how to translate certain words. Of course, Adelphoi here, um, you know, traditionally translated brothers, and then some translations translated brothers and sisters, and the NIV was taken a task for translating this as brothers and sisters because they understood that the word, although masculine and gender, included both men and women in its scope. Um, and I think it's very unfortunate those kinds of attacks have taken place. Yudaioi, traditionally translated Jews. Um, but there are some strange passages in the Gospel of John that talks about how the Jews were trying to, to kill Jesus. And that's really weird because every single person in the story was a Jew. And so, I mean, the Jews were also like Jesus was the Jew, and the Jews were Jesus' disciples, and the Jews were following Jesus, and some Jews were trying to kill Jesus. So how do you make sense of, how do you translate that? We're going to come back to some of those questions, and some of my slides aren't in the best order, although maybe there's a deep, deep inner logic that I'm just not sharing with you, and you can figure that out later. <laughs> One of the challenges is the challenge of coordinating between agencies to avoid duplication of efforts and poor stewardship. I mean, that's, I, I was part of the translation team of the FOBI agencies, uh, which was a team that tries to coordinate between various Bible translation agencies because they found out, you know what? We're working on a translation in this language. Oh, you are? So are we. We've been working on that for 10 years. Oh, well, we've been working on that for five years. Well, maybe we should have communicated with each other so that we don't have two different translation teams trying to do the same thing unaware of the others. So, um, and then that also means having to give up some of your confidentiality of things that you're working on. That's one of the, cha the challenges today. There are dangers of hurrying and a temptation to rush. The desire to get the job done so that Jesus can come back or to get the job done because donors want the job done quickly. And some agencies promising we can translate a whole Bible in like a month, even though it's taking everyone else eight to 10 years. And I won't go into how, what that was all about, but there are dangers that come from trying to get it done too quickly. Work that is poor quality may lead readers to decide that scripture is incoherent. 
or that the scripture itself is as deeply flawed as the translation because they aren't necessarily able to distinguish between the translation and the scripture. I was a prison chaplain for just one year of my life before we went to Portugal as missionaries, and we'd have uh, a very generous organization come in for giving away Bibles. And they would come into the prison and hand out New Testaments to all of the inmates. And I always urged them to use a contemporary translation, but the tendency was to give away a translation that was done in 1611. I won't mention which translation that is. <laughs> Uh, but there was an English Bible translation done in 1611, and they would hand these out to barely liber literate prisoners. And then the next day, I would see the waste bins just full of these little New Testaments and wonder to myself how many people picked it up and tried to read it and just decided I could never study or read or understand God's Word because it's all like a foreign language to me. Um, well, that can happen not just because it's um, you know, 400 years old and out of date in that sense, but it can also happen if you rush through the work and don't think through all of the issues. One of the challenges Bible translation faces is that it's a kind of what translation scholars, and by that I mean people translating French poetry into Japanese or other things, refer to as vulnerable translation. Vulnerable translation is a kind of translation you're doing where people that are getting the translation already think they know what it's supposed to say before they read it. So you're translating the Bible for the first time into this language, but some people in that community speak Spanish and they have a Spanish Bible. And so before they ever read the translation in the new language, they already know what the Spanish Bible says. And if your Bible doesn't say exactly the same thing that their version of the Spanish Bible says, then you're going to be in for it because you're vulnerable. Now, this doesn't happen if you're translating, say, some new novel in, in Russian, and you're translating it into Korean for the first time in a community where nobody speaks Russian. You give them the translation into Korean, and they say, wow, this is amazing. But when you give them a translation of something that they already know, then you as a translator are vulnerable, and so is your translation, because people will hold it up to a standard that may or may not be a fair standard, for assessing a translation. There's the challenge of balancing the value of accountability. Bible, translation, Bible translators and translation agencies should be accountable, but the challenge of having every difficult decision second-guessed by people on the other side of the world who aren't familiar with the linguistic and cultural issues and maybe not be aware of how similar kinds of patterns are reflected in their own Bible translation. They assume that their translation doesn't have, doesn't reflect any difficult decisions that could have been second-guessed. But they hear about something that a Wycliffe Bible translator is doing someplace in the other part of the world, and then suddenly, frankly, we're all experts not only on the Bible, but on linguistic issues and on whatever that language is that they had never heard of before the article was, or the blog post was written. And Bible translators have to live with living in a glass house as they carry out their work in a way that's unlike anything from previous centuries. I mean, today, you could, you could make a decision and people all over the world could know about it and have opinions about it within a week. And that's a difficult context in which to work. Many of you wouldn't realize that the word kidneys, not the word kidneys, do you know why I can say with authority the word kidneys does not show up in the original text of Psalm 26? Oh, because it's an English word. Psalm 26 was written in Hebrew. I, I thought Beeson trained people <laughs> to know these kinds of things. The word kidneys does not show up anywhere in the Bible. Um, but the word that would mean kidneys uh, does show up in Psalm 26 too, but you won't find it there. You won't find it in a number of different places because it, the word is the kidneys and heart is usually translated heart and mind. But I can easily see somebody doing that on the translation field and getting in trouble for it, and people back home not realizing their own Bible has heart and kidneys, um, which we translate as heart and mind. These are difficult issues. Is Allah ever an acceptable translation for, and I don't know why there's an open or closed parenthesis, is it ever an acceptable translation for Elohim or for Theos? Is it ever an, a, a, an appropriate word to use for God? And if you have a very clear, obvious answer to that, 
we should talk about that during our Q&A session because it isn't so easy. And actually, there isn't one simple answer to this person's viewpoint. The NIV and NRSV wrestled with how to translate these words, which are typically translated uh, man or human being and son of man in Psalm 8.5. So should it be man and son of man? Should it be mankind and human beings? Should it be human beings and mortals? And these are all actual translations, contemporary Bible translations. Should it be human race and mankind? And we'll look at that in a moment. And some people are concerned because, and, and I'm not saying there's not a good reason for it, some of these change a singular into plural, and is that a problem, or is that ever acceptable? ESV. There's a video online you can read where the translators wrestle with this word, doulos, usually translated slave um, because it means uh, slave. Um, and they wrestle with whether they should translate it that way or translate it bondservant, even though nobody would know what that means. And they decided to translate it bondservant because they felt like the word slave was too historically, ideologically tainted. Um, which, frankly, if it weren't the ESV, if some other translation said we didn't want to translate it that way because in the local culture, the, the wording people think we should use would be ideologically and theologically tainted, that would be a big deal across international news. You follow me? Get to the question and answer. By the way, this is an interesting case. Psalm 32 in the, uh, in the Hebrew, as translated here, Blessed is the one whose transgressions are forgiven. This is a singular. The one whose transgressions, singular. Singular. Don't forget that. Singular. Can I hear an amen? Amen. amen. Uh, Paul quotes it in Romans 4, 7. Blessed are those whose transgressions are forgiven. What? That's a plural. I said singular. But, but in the Greek, it's, it's plural. The Greek translation went from singular to plural, and Paul quoted the Septuagint in the plural. Maybe I need to be a little bit more hesitant about whether or not it's always wrong to change a singular into the plural if the Septuagint does that to the Hebrew, and Paul quotes it and doesn't bat an eye. But maybe, maybe not. I'm going to move on. Adelphoi. In RSV says brothers and sisters. NIV says brothers and sisters. ESV says brothers but then adds a footnote that says the plural Greek Adelphoi translated brothers refers to siblings in a family and New Testament usage depending on context may mean. It may mean brothers and sisters, um, like the net translation has it. Here's Eudioi, usually translated Jews. That NRSV has the Jews. So does the ESV and so does... Um, no, net translation has Jewish leaders, and so does the NIV has Jewish leaders. Um, but this is part of that question. It seems, does, does it really mean Jew? Now, the ESV has, uh, I think, a helpful footnote here. It says, or Judeans, Greek Judaioi, probably refers here to Jewish religious leaders and others under their influence at that time. By the way, this is one of the escape hatches that translators sometimes use. Um, so they didn't want to translate it Jewish leaders, but we can add a footnote, and then we can have our lexical uh, linguistic cake and, and eat it too. And, and I, that's not a criticism of the ESV. They all do it, and it's useful, except in those languages where nobody will ever read a footnote. And if you're reading on an iPad or an iPhone, you're probably not reading any of the footnotes. Matthew 17, 15, this is one of those in epileptic. And then down here we have epileptic. Uh, but others say have seizures, have seizures, and, and the Greek word actually has to do with the moon, and it's, it's the reason why we have those ideas of being moonstruck or a, a lunatic, because in that context, this was associated with the influence of the moon. So there's the question, to what extent should we bring in concepts from the modern world? We've already talked about that a little bit. Key opportunities. There are opportunities thanks to unprecedented Find unprecedented financial support, E10, which stands for every tribe, every nation, and others are pouring millions of dollars into Bible translation work. In the four years that I worked for American Bible Society, I, I make up figures like this all the time, but I would say 87.95% uh, uh, of all of my work was paid for by E10, 
American Bible Society would ask me to do it. I'd keep all my receipts, turn it in, and E10 would reimburse millions of dollars for which we should be grateful. Much of that, not all, much of that coming from the Green family, with which you may be familiar. Opportunities to learn from the field of translation studies. Today, the world of Bible translation has, for many years, it's tended to be kind of in a silo, just learning from other Bible translators. There's a whole academic interdisciplinary field called translation studies, uh, which is making some um, fine uh, discoveries and observations about how translation works and issues to be sensitive to and aware of, and now more and more Bible translators are being introduced to um, other kinds of insights drawn from this field. There are opportunities today to work as exegetical checkers and advisors, and I'm thinking about particularly for people from the Western world, but also, fortunately, people from around the world. Opportunities to work as cons translation consultants after gaining experience on initial Bible translation project if you show that you're gifted and quite able. There are tremendous needs. The great bottleneck in Bible translation today is in the lack of people to serve in these roles to do what's called quality control to give that feedback and to help translation teams uh, work through difficult issues and decide when is this translation ready to go public. Um, and there haven't been enough people as exegetical checkers, advisors, or translation consultants. If we had many more, much more work would be done more efficiently, more quickly. And there are opportunities to support Bible translation, not only or especially Western missionaries involved in translation, which is a very worthy cause, but also national Bible societies and other Bible translators from around the world. They're, they have fewer resources, but they are doing extreme, extremely important work in Bible translation and uh, greatly in need of more infrastructure, more financial support to carry that work out. This is one of the agencies that I mentioned earlier, the BTL is Bible Translation Literacy, formed out of Kenya, which is a member of the Wycliffe Global Alliance. Well, I have like, no, I have more than seven minutes. That's fast. I have eight minutes. Ah, plenty of time. The task is unfinished. These are languages with and without scripture. So these are 683 languages that have a whole Bible, 1,500 that have a New Testament, another 1,100 that have um, portions of Scripture, and then about 4,000 languages that really don't have anything. In terms of people, about 5 billion people that have Scripture, um, another 700 million that have New Testaments, another 424 that have just portions, and 250 million without any scripture. And these are the places and basically the amount of uh, um, languages in each area, 124 in the Americas, 700 languages uh, still needing Bible translation in Africa. You get the idea. Uh, my work was translating translation uh, consultants from all over the world that would gather in Italy for training every year, but then I also worked directly with Bible translators in Angola and in the far uh, northeast of, of India. Um, and, and in Angola, I was working with 21 translators divided into three, so seven translation teams for seven languages, languages in Angola that don't have the Bible in that language yet. And in northeastern uh, India, in the area called Nagaland, I was working with, and with a team, not just me, um, the team was working with 21 translators, but there they were all one person per translation team, so 21 different languages up there uh, that didn't have God's word yet. It will be a never-ending task. Some people are saying we can't wait till such and such a year when we get it all done, but languages change, just in English. The, development from man and he to one and they, and the King James Version says prevent when it means proceed, and all kinds of changes in the English language and other languages. There are new linguistic discoveries made about meanings of Hebrew, Aramaic, or Greek words and expressions and reference. Uh, I've published two articles, one on Acts 17.11 and one on 1 Corinthians 7, one suggesting that we haven't actually understood what key Greek words mean in those verses. So far, I'm grateful to the um, the CSB, the, uh, is that right? 
yeah, the Christian Standard Bible. They took on board my argument on 7-1, so that's, that's the Bible I bring to church every Sunday, and I don't know why anyone <laughs> would bring any other Bible. Uh, they haven't quite caught on to Acts 17-11 yet. New archaeological discoveries that clarify what texts are talking about. They weren't sure about a word in 1 Kings 6.31. It was talking about five-sided doors or five-something about the doors, but then archaeology brought up a kind of uh, door that showed recessed door frames, and they realized, oh, this is a term for talking about five recessed um, door frames. And so these are things that we learn along the way. The owners of the ESV translation, right after it came out, they announced they would never revise it again. It was done forever. And then, what was it, a month or so later, they said, uh, our bad, uh, actually this will have to go through revision and we aren't done once and forever. The King James Version was a revision of the Bishop's Bible and it was revised multiple times over the centuries and many modern translations are further revisions, including the Revised Version, the American Standard Version, the Revised Standard Version, the NRSV and the ESV are all part of this translation tradition. Very little translation is done from scratch today. It's more retranslation than anything else. And more than one kind of translation may be needed for different audiences and purposes. Uh, different needs for young people than adults, for biblically literate and newcomers, etc. <sighs> so there were one or two issues I raised along the way. Um, and I realized that it wasn't all that well organized, but I'd be happy to take... We have five minutes and you have to go to class, but if you want to skip class, no, I didn't say that. If anyone doesn't have class, I'd be happy to chat. There's a microphone over there. Yes, and we'll need the question in the microphone so we can record it, please. First question. Thank you, Dr. Champa. Um, what, does the, what does it look like when translating scripture into unreached languages as far as where do you start with that? Like in scripture, is it... Just portions of the Gospels, or how does that go? That's a great question. And those decisions used to be made by translation agencies who would just say, well, we think the, the Gospel of John should be translated first because, you know, it, it gets right to salvation and eternal life, or, or the Gospel of Mark because it's simple and active. Um, more recently, people are saying, you know, maybe we should let the people that are needing the translation, and they're usually their churches already, maybe they should be able to wait. And in many cases, they actually can identify and understand the Old Testament better than the New Testament. People don't usually translate all of the Old Testament first, but they might start translating parts of the Old Testament which are essential for understanding what's going on in the New Testament. So often it's Old Testament portions that are being done now. And in the best case scenario, these things are discussed with the local churches to find out what their scripture engagement needs and desires are and to work from that kind of position. Great question. I settled everything. There are no more questions, no more doubts. Here comes the heavy hitting question. I also know if they go to class or not, so that's why I'm going to ask a question, I guess. Uh, that's right. You, the last point, I think, on your presentation talked about different, different audiences. Mm -hmm. So one of, the, one of the things, and we've We've had, so Bill Mounts was just here for a few days. We had a Bible translation lecture earlier in the semester. Uh, raises some questions. One is, is the Bible translation intended for everyday reading, whether young adult or senior adult or in between, or is it intended for teaching? Because if you're going to be teaching the scriptures, you're going to need to explain a word like justification in English. But if it's just intended for reading, you would probably go with, you know, righteous in God's sight. You know, mm -hmm. God declares the person righteous. Mm -hmm. So you talk just a little bit about your experience, maybe, and how you how you see that. It's I'm sure it's not a one to one thing, but no, I mean that's a very helpful explanation of 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 the challenge. And I think many Bible translators would say that ultimately most cultures and languages need more than one translation because no one translation does everything well. And that's the point that I would always make. Somebody asked me, what's the best translation? I would say, best translation for whom, who wants to do what with it? Um, and after I know who you want it for and what they want, to, do they want to know Do they want to know whether or not there was such a thing as DNA or epilepsy and they knew about this or not? 
Or is it okay if they talk about how many dollars this thing was worth, even though they didn't use dollars? Um, so that's the question is, who am I translating for? Um, and what do they want to do with it? And this is actually a whole thing I didn't mention called functionalist approaches, which raises these kinds of questions. Who am I translating for? What do they want to do with it? And then we have to have a conversation with them. Do they need a Bible that's going to be best used for teachers? And is this the first Bible they need? Or do they want to give this out to everyone and it should be read by as many people as possible and we have to figure out what the average reading level is? By the way, any translation, if you have too much, we talk about foreignization and domestication, if there's too much in it, there's, excuse me, who gave me Coke? Um, <laughs> if there's too much foreign material, people will just give up in frustration. Um, but there has to be something, it can't all be domesticated, um, but you have to wrestle with that question. How much new information can we include for this translation? Um, many areas of the world first get a more formal equivalent kind of thing, a more uh, translation which is more for people that are better informed and biblically literate. And often the second translation, at least it used to be that way, and the second translation was a common reader translation. In many places, now it's the other way around. They get the common reader translation that most people should be able to read and understand first, and then maybe they come back and get a formal equivalent after that. But those are questions that they're always wrestling with.